The Cornelius Oregon Church of Christ welcomes you. In this lesson, Evangelist Brian Haynes discusses the kingdom, the wedding feast. Jesus described a wedding feast that mirrors his kingdom. Why is it important to understand what our invitation entails? This lesson was delivered on May 12, 2024. I'd like to invite all of you, if you would, get your Bibles out or grab one of those pew Bibles there with you. Get out on your phone, I guess, huh? Let's go together to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. Going to just spend a couple of minutes this morning in a parable, a parable that's just a a lot of fun to study. It's an interesting parable. It was an important parable, too. A parable that teaches us a great deal, both about the kingdom, that, as that song we just sang, the kingdom that is now open for men, and about our standing within it. So let's read together in Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted calf are killed, and All things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it. Then they went their ways. One to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. When the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out to the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him out of the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called and few are chosen. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. You know that expression, the idea of the kingdom, is used about 150 times in the New Testament, a lot of different ways, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, terms that you're very familiar with, particularly in the book of Matthew, probably uh, the person who uses it the most, but all four of the uh, writers about the life of Jesus use that term a great deal to describe uh, the characteristics of the kingdom. I was talking this morning with Sean about uh, passages to read as we prepare ourselves. And he said, you know, one that comes to my mind is in Daniel chapter 2, whenever the prophet Daniel was uh, going and uh, speaking with the king of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the most powerful king in the world at the time. And and he said, one day, Nebuchadnezzar, there's going to be another kingdom that's going to come. He said, it'll be the fourth kingdom of the great kingdoms of the world. He says, yours being the first, the, the Persians that were to come, the next, the Greeks. He says, and during the time of the fourth empire, we know that today is the Romans. He said, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom won't be left for another people. It'll crush and put an end to all kingdoms. It itself will endure forever. That promise of a kingdom that's particularly emphasized in Daniel, but but is addressed by a great many of the prophets of the Old Testament, was something that they said would happen when the Savior of the world showed up. So it was no surprise that whenever John the Baptist, uh, the person who's introducing us to the Savior of the world, when he arrives and he begins to tell people uh, about the coming of the Savior, he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Soon after that, Mark chapter 1 Uh, after John begins that message in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, Jesus takes up that uh, preaching and Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. The message of the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus begins preaching. He says, the kingdom's here. It's arriving. It's, it's at hand. It, it's, it's right around the corner, so to speak. And as he's trying to convince people what this meant there, a lot of them are wondering, well, you know, we, we've got the Romans. Or, uh, is there going to be some great army that's going to come in and destroy everything? Is there going to be a capital city set up in Jerusalem or things like that? And Jesus surprises everybody by saying, no, wait a second. No, because my kingdom is not of this world. In John chapter 18 and verse 36, as Jesus was elaborating this, that's, that was his exact message to the Roman governor Pilate. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, Jesus says it a second time here, my kingdom is not of this realm. Indeed, as Jesus would try to elaborate to get people to understand that, he would say, you know, the kingdom isn't, isn't something that's going to come with observation. He says, you're not going to see it uh, whenever they're asking Jesus about the kingdom. He says, well, you're not going to see a physical kingdom out there. He says that the people aren't going to say, look, see here, there it is. For indeed, he says, the kingdom of God is something that's going to be within you. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. You know, we, we realize that even to this day, there are still people that think that there's physically a kingdom uh, to, going to be established on earth and it's going to have like a capital city and it's going to have, uh, and yet Jesus says long ago, he had arrived for the purpose of setting that kingdom up. It was then that he was establishing it. And he says, it's not something that's about this world. You're not going to see a physical kingdom. If there was any question about it, Jesus would tell people again and again and again that there were people that were he was talking to. The people that he was talking to right there that were standing right with him, he says, you're not going to die before you see or you are aware of the coming of the kingdom of God. That is the message of the kingdom. It's one of the most important messages in the Bible. It's the idea of God's uh, authority coming to earth, or as Jesus would put it, the authority of God being the same in heaven as it is on earth. It's a big thing. It's important. And yet it was an idea that for a lot of people, it was just a real struggle to figure out what it was Jesus wants you to understand about the kingdom, about the kingdom. Where God says that oftentimes when Jesus was trying to convey an idea, he would do so in parables, meaning sayings or teachings that were uh, similitudes. They were, uh, they were uh, metaphorical stories that were meant to tell a different truth. And the word of God says that Jesus spoke constantly in parables. He covered his big ideas in parables, and he taught us quite a few parables that he begins by saying the kingdom of heaven is like, and it would be things like the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, or uh, the kingdom of heaven is like, it talks about a wedding feast, or workers in a vineyard, or different things like that, that there's lots of expressions where Jesus would say the kingdom of heaven is like if you want a little bit of extra reading this week, you can run over to Matthew 13 and you'd read there a series of parables where Jesus would say, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. I want to talk this morning about the parable that we just read a moment ago, Matthew chapter 22. And I want to grab a couple of ideas out of this parable uh, that I think are well worth us uh, saying for a moment, considering the big idea, because the big idea here has a lot of value to us if we put it together. When you look at this parable, um, when you look at any parable, sometimes what you're meant to do is to draw out the main characters or ideas and identify what they are. So if we talk about a king having a, or arranging a marriage for his son, I imagine most of you say, well, a king, a great father, that's probably uh, our heavenly father. That's not a hard one, right? The parable begins pointing to God the Father. And it says that he has arranged a marriage for his son. Well, who's the son of God? You don't have to read far in the New Testament to find out that the son of God is Jesus. That Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's the son of God. And the parable begins by saying, here it is that the heavenly father has arranged something like a marriage for his son. 
Now that idea of a marriage is important because it's trying to describe for us an idea of a relationship that God is going to have with us. You probably understand this, but maybe you've not heard this before. A marriage is a relationship that the Bible defines as a covenant. A covenant. Covenant's a very special word. There aren't a lot of covenants left in our society today. I think there's still some property covenants, but a covenant is a binding contract that you really can't get out of. It's the kind of contract that has terms. These days, we don't really have contracts like that anymore, but it's a contract that you really can't get out of, a covenant relationship. God defines his relationship with mankind in terms of covenants. He says to Abraham, I'll make a covenant with you. He says to Noah, I'll make a covenant with you. Uh, He says to Moses, uh, to Israel through Moses, I'll make a covenant with you. Covenant is an agreement where there's an expectation, there's a reward, but there's also a penalty. From our legal perspective, it's a lot like uh, the, the, the law, a criminal matter, or a contract matter brought together and having elements of both. And marriage is a covenant. So it's no surprise that throughout the Old Testament, when God talks about his covenant with Israel, he calls it a marriage. He talks about Israel being unfaithful to him. That's a conversation that God had a lot in the Old Testament. And it's no surprise then that when God talks about the relationship he has with believers today, that he would describe it as a marriage. Indeed, if we were to read elsewhere in the scriptures, we would read about uh, the church being the bride of Christ. One one of many places that said, Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle Paul was talking about marriage, uh, husbands and wives, and he says, for this reason, a man leaves his father and mother, he's joined to his wife, the two become one flesh. This is a great mystery. I'm speaking about concerning Christ and the church. The church that Jesus built, that's the bride of Christ, and it's using that language to try to describe the idea that we have a covenant relationship if we're part of Jesus' church. Now, the reading that we had this morning, you might remember that Sean read for us Psalm 45. I asked Sean to read that one because that is a prophetic image. <clears throat> it's a very unusual psalm. It's a psalm written from a perspective of a bunch of people getting excited about a great wedding day coming. And they're talking about the son of the king, and they're talking about how he's going to uh, enrich everybody who comes to this wedding and how excited they should be. This was written back uh, in the days of King David, a thousand years before Jesus. And, and you might think of it like this. It's a wedding invitation. Any of you getting wedding invitations this year? Uh, You know, usually it says RSVP, right? You know, Wendy, we got a wedding invitation. I heard Wendy say yesterday, hey, I RSVP'd for all of us because she said, I knew the rest of you wouldn't. She was like, RSVP to the wedding. You get a wedding invitation, it's several months apart. Imagine a wedding invitation that was a thousand years before. That's what Psalm 45 is. It's a wedding invitation that was sent out a thousand years before the coming of the groom and the preparation of the bride. Who was it sent to? Well, in in Matthew chapter 22, uh, the group that was invited to the wedding feast is mentioned there in verse 3. And we might say, well, who was that first invitation, that invitation in, in Psalm 45 sent to? It was sent to the children of Israel, the Israelites. They were the first guests, so to speak. Right before this, Jesus had been telling the Israelites that they had a big problem. In fact, if you got your fingers in Matthew chapter 22, just turn back a couple of verses to the very end of chapter 21. Remember, by the way, verses and chapters, those are our invention. Uh, The scriptures, this would have just read through as one text. But you jump back to Jesus talking to them in chapter 21 and verse 42, and Jesus is telling the Israelites, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And Jesus says in verse 43, therefore I say to you, these are the Israelites of his day, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but whomever it falls will grind him to powder. By the way, if there's any question about this, verse 45, now the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables. They perceived he was speaking of them 
leading us to chapter 22 and verse 1. The first guests were the nation of Israel. And by and large, and we're going to be careful here because this isn't a totality statement, but the great majority of that nation is going to reject Jesus. Not a surprise because the prophets had said that when he came, he would be rejected. Jesus just read one of those prophets out of Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone the builders rejected. They're the builders. Jesus goes to this one quite a bit, by the way, and says, look, it was prophesied you're going to reject me. We knew that would happen. But we also knew that that rejection would open the door so that so many more might come. And as I said, I want to be careful to say there were Israelites that didn't reject Jesus. The apostles are perfect examples of that. But by and large, yeah, that nation did. Their rejection of Jesus, what I think is so interesting is, is look how that rejection came about in verse 5. Some of them just kind of laughed at Jesus or laughed at the invitation to the wedding. Others just ignored it. They didn't pay attention. They had other things on their mind. Some resented it and went so far as to abuse or even kill his servants. What a broad range of responses. I don't know about you, but if mailing out a wedding invitation, you know, you send it out there and you think, well, you know, some people might ignore it. Okay, that might happen. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to beat up the mailman for it, right? That's what they did. They beat up the prophets that brought these messages. A lot of the prophets of the Old Testament were murdered. Jesus will address that actually in the next chapter in Matthew and say, you know, you've got a lot of guilt for what you've done to the prophets of God throughout the past. But the big idea was they just, for a variety of reasons, didn't care. And God reacted to all of this the same way. Did you notice that? Whether it was just, I don't care, or I hate this marriage, Whatever the spectrum was of rejection, the king is furious, verse 7, and he sent his armies and they destroyed that city. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to elaborate on that when he prophesies about the destruction of the city, the city of Jerusalem, the capital at that time for the Israelites. So after Jesus, uh, after the parable goes on to say this in verses 9 and 10, then they say, you know what? The ones that, verse 8, they weren't worthy. The first guests weren't. So let's get more guests. Let's go out and let's grab everybody. That's a crazy thing to think about. I always think Jesus' stories when people heard it, you have to wonder if people laughed when he says, let's just go out and invite everybody. See the people that are you know, on the highways, meaning people sleeping on the road. Let's just ask them to come. Let's just ask everybody. Yeah, you know, just let everybody know. Everybody should come to this feast. It says both bad and good. One of the songs we sang talked about the kingdom of heaven being opened and being opened for people that, that, that are not good people. True. That's the nature of this kingdom that Jesus has opened, a kingdom that uh, sometimes we describe it as being manifested by the authority of Christ. Sometimes we just talk about it like the church. All of those things would be accurate. So all mankind is invited to this feast. When Jesus arose from the grave here at the end of the book of Matthew, he'll send uh, that great invitation. He'll say, all authority. You know, maybe the best word for kingdom is the word authority. Maybe every time you see the word kingdom of God, you just think authority of God, and you might understand exactly Jesus' point. All authority, all kingdom has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. All of it, all of it. There's nothing left that Jesus doesn't have when he arises from the grave. And he sends his disciples to go and make disciples. He sends his apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Get out there, and he says, and start baptizing people. Making them my disciples, teaching them. Now that message kind of, I guess, brings you to a question about how our men brought to this. Jesus actually talks about those that are called. In fact, in verse 14, he says, many are called and few are chosen. Uh, who are the many that are called? And the many are everybody. That's what he said, right? That's what he says again later on, right? Everybody is called. The, the call goes out to everybody. In fact, when Jesus talks about the calling in John chapter 6 and verse 44, and he talks about drawing men to him, that God would draw men to him, and he says, that'll work, that'll happen by me being raised up on the cross. When Jesus dies on the cross, that's a call to the whole human race that you've got a Savior. And you have a place in a kingdom if you want it. Everybody is called. Jesus will say that's his word that goes out. That's the call. 
The word of God is the call. It's not, uh, be careful, it's not a feeling. It's not, you know, I just felt something happen. He says, here, here is the message. The message, this is the invitation. It's written and it's given to all. But Jesus also said, not many are going to take it. Many are called, few chosen, meaning they'll, they'll come. In Luke 13, verse 23, one of his disciples is, is talking about the kingdom and, and talking about this language Jesus gives about many are called and choose a few are chosen. He said, well, Lord, are there few who are saved? And Jesus says, yeah. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Will not be able to. Parable of the wedding. You know, in Mark and Luke, whenever the parable of the wedding is given, it stops here. It kind of ends at this point. And it's given us something huge to think about. About an idea of Jesus' kingdom being an invitation to join him and to be a part of his rule by coming to him, by being obedient to the gospel, by following that message that, that in Matthew chapter 28 began to be preached of repenting and being baptized, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and being a part of the kingdom. But there's a little tidbit here that I've always found extra interesting that is added in here. By the way, when I say things like it's added in, I mean uh, that Matthew, by the power of the Holy Spirit, brought this part to our attention, and it's kind of neat. It says that while the king is looking at his wedding feast, his kingdom, he notes a man who's there without a wedding garment. You know, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about a wedding garment. You know, uh, if you go back in the Old Testament, you'll read about one of the men of faith, uh, a guy named Samson. And Samson, when he got married, got garments for all the men in his wedding. Uh, what we kind of understand is in ancient times, you had a wedding feast, uh, and if you were particularly a rich person and you invited people, you would actually provide for them the garments they might wear. Now, we still kind of have that tradition, right? Um, if you've been to a wedding, you'll notice all the groomsmen, all the men that stand with the groom wear the same garment. Uh, the, the groom might traditionally pay for that, but probably rent it. The bridesmaids, they'll wear the same garment. Traditionally, again, it might be the case that that bride has paid for, has purchased those garments. Why do they wear them? So that there's a sense of they're part of the wedding party, right? That's kind of important. What if you had a wedding party, though, where, you know, you had the bridesmaids up there, and then one of them isn't wearing that. There. She's wearing jeans and a T-shirt. You think, well, that doesn't look right. One of the, you see the groomsmen there, and one of the groomsmen is, uh, is wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts. I like Hawaiian shirts. Tell you what, I was about to say, if I get married again, but it won't happen. <laughs> but if there's, you know, I'd, boy, Hawaiian shirts, that'd be the way to go. I'm in a lot of trouble. But the truth is, you know, might choose those different things. But the point is, you would know there was something wrong. As this, as this king is going through the feast, he sees a man there who, who, who had to have got in and been given a garment. And he's not wearing it. And so the man is, verse 12, friend, how, do, how are you here without a garment? I think this is a really important little tidbit for us to think about. In some ways, I think this could be, for me, one of the most important parts of this parable, because this is about us. Verses 11, 12, 13, this is you and I. Everything else is the big picture idea. The big picture of the kingdom of heaven is that Jesus came to establish an authority by which human beings could be saved, could enter a relationship with God. That authority is called the kingdom, and when you become a Christian, you join the kingdom. That's what Jesus is teaching. Now, that's a big idea, little idea, you personally. The Word of God tells you and I that when we obey the gospel, and you know that term obey the gospel is used several times in the scriptures to describe the idea of, of hearing the Word of God and believing. I'm, I'm just talking out of the New Testament, book of Acts. You turn away from sin by repentance, you confess Jesus as Lord, and you're baptized. The Bible says that at the point you are baptized, something happens, right? Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, here the Apostle Paul says it in a nice way. He says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ. Have clothed yourselves in Christ. I think it's kind of important for you to kind of picture for a moment. Because 
we're trying to get a picture of an idea of, uh, of a transformation that occurs. And does not a transformation, uh, at least a physical transformation, is the biggest transformation we have, what we wear, if we change that, we change everything. You know, when somebody makes the commitment to join the service, that's kind of like a covenant, actually. Maybe I should say that joining the military is a lot like entering into a covenant. Uh, one of the things you do is you swear an oath, right? You sw swear to defend the Constitution against all enemies. You, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, sign your name on this, and then they give you a uniform, and you put on that uniform. And that moment of putting on that uniform is a transformation moment because you cease to be you in a lot of ways, right? And you become, the word uniform, one form. You become a part of something. Your uniform makes you part of something. Indeed, we even have insignias and badges that tell us what specific part of that is. But each uniform of each branch of service is a little different so that you say, hey, I, I can tell this is an airman. Uh, this is a sailor. And I can tell what, uh, what unit this airman is with or whether or not he's a pilot or, uh, you know, if, if this man's a soldier. I can tell what division he's in by the, by the uniform that he wears. When we are baptized into Christ, we put on a military uniform, uh, in a sense. We become the soldiers of Christ. We become the priests of God. We're given a priestly garment that, that brings us into that service. There's a lot, of, a lot of, uh, uh, of analogies we could make about what happens whenever we're baptized. Jesus said, though, the only way you're going to get the kingdom of heaven, we talked about this one last week, being born of water in the Spirit. Baptism is the way we enter the feast. How do you get in the wedding feast here in verse 11? You get the wedding garment. You get the wedding garment. You're baptized into Christ. You put on Christ. You walk in. You have the garment. Just like all those tuxedoed men look like the groom, you look like Christ because you've put on Christ in baptism. But there's something important here because this man took it off, right? How do you take off baptism? Well, don't think of it like that. Think of it as Christ. When you're baptized, you put on Christ. And the Word of God has a lot to say about putting on Christ again and again and again throughout the Scriptures. The Apostle Paul told the, the Romans, uh, trying to get them to, to live lives in Christ in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he talked about being living sacrifices. And in chapter 13, he says, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do, how do you keep him on? Well, you make no provisions for the lust of the flesh, for the flesh in regards to its lusts. When you put on Christ, you keep him on by maintaining a godly demeanor, a godly attitude, a godly focus on things. That's how you keep Christ on. Like the soldier who maintains his uniform, <clears throat> he does so because partly that maintains his position. Jesus gave a really interesting warning in the book of Revelation, chapter 16 and verse 15. It was just kind of out of the blue. In fact, in fact, if you were, some of your Bibles, if you go back to Revelation 16 and verse 15, you'll notice that they actually just dropped the words in red there, acknowledging this is kind of a strange place to have made this statement. It's kind of a, what we call a parenthetical statement. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of just put in there as a, hey, pay attention. Jesus says, hey, behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. Kind of a, kind of a, at first, a little awkward here to think about, but I want you to think about what he's saying here. You've been given a garment. Don't take it off. Don't take off the garment by being disobedient to the way of Christ. That's what the second part of this parable is about. It's about you and I. And he's saying, hey, if you, if you put on Jesus Christ in baptism, don't, by putting on worldly attitudes, take him off again. Because if you take him off and Jesus catches you, and how can Jesus catch you? Well, uh, this passage, he says, I'm going to come one day and surprise you. So that's kind of a warning. But, but it just might be the idea that the day I, I'm held accountable to God, whatever it is, and he catches you without that garment. What happened here? Is there anything you can say to Jesus? Well, Jesus, it's just kind of hard to be a Christian sometimes. And I kind of took it off because, you know, I had, I had some things come up. I intended to go back to you. I mean, I, I was going to get back and put these things back on. But just right now, it wasn't. 
No, it says in verse 12 that the man is speechless because there's nothing you say that makes it okay. If your life is such that you have taken off Christ, boy, imagine what that's like. You know, a group of soldiers and one of the soldiers, you're preparing for a parade or you're preparing for a presentation and one of the men shows up and he's in jeans and a t-shirt and the rest of you are in a panic. Hey, but don't go out there looking like that. You go out there and he see the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the colonel sees you and the, the company commander sees you, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Here, the king said to his servants, bind him hat and foot, cast him away, cast him into outer darkness. How big a deal is it to God that we maintain our presence in Christ? And the answer is... It is, then the king said to servants, bind him, cast him, cast him hand and foot, take him away, cast him in outer darkness. Serious. That's about the most serious language there is in the Bible. And he's talking to us. Jesus is saying, hey, are you a part of the kingdom? That's great. You get to be in the wedding. You get to, you get to go home to heaven. That's the promise that we're really looking forward to. But if you don't keep the garment on, you lose everything. There's several times in the scripture where it actually says you are in a worse condition than you were had you never done it. Kind of interesting, uh, you know, because the people that abused the king, they were, uh, they were destroyed. Uh, it does sound a little worse in verse 13 about the fate of those that were disobedient. What a parable, right? I hope you found it as interesting as I always find it. Every time I read this, I just got to reading, studying this with somebody just recently. Every time I read it, I'm drawn into it, and I think, wow, what a thing. Every human being has been invited to join God in eternity. God paid an incredible amount. Think about how much this wedding must have cost. Some of you have paid for weddings, and you know they cost a lot. I have a friend who once told his daughters, you can either go to college or you can get married, but I, I don't think I can afford both. Weddings can be pretty pricey. What about a wedding like this? What about the wedding that you read about in Psalm 45? How much did it cost? It cost the Son of God. The most expensive purchasing price in, human, in, in history. That is the invitation you have been invited to, to join God in eternity. And it's important to remember that other people have been invited and they're going to choose not to attend, and that's terrible. But what you personally need to take up is the idea that you come to this wedding receiving the invitation. The invitation is the scriptures. It's given to every human being. You all have a wedding invitation, but you are admitted as guests by putting on the garment. That garment is Jesus Christ. Let's take a second. Let's go to our Father in a word of prayer about these things. If you would join me. Most holy God and Father in heaven, we come before you in prayer. And Father, this morning we have considered the nature of the kingdom and, and the characteristics that you have described to it. And sometimes, Father, these things can be frightening, they can be exciting, they can be things that we want to know more about. We pray for, earnestly, though, Father, every one of us has allowed this message to sink within our hearts to consider your great invitation and what, what is expected of us that we might be people that participate. Father, help us both to be participants and to encourage others to participate as well. To be fixated on the great joy and reward that this promise offers to us, Father, help us to be mindful of that. And Father, if ever we are weak and we, we stumble, we don't maintain our garment the way we should, we know you have told us that if we confess our sins to you, you're just... You'll cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Father, please forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Help us to be found faithful when our Lord returns. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I've said it many times. I'll say it again. How, how does somebody respond to the invitation? How do they RSVP to the great invitation to the great wedding? And I tell you what, it's not that I come up with ideas and say, well, here's what I think. 
I, I walk through the scriptures, you walk through the scriptures, and you see that when people respond in a way that the Bible says they are added to Christ, it always happens the same way. It begins when they hear the word of God and they believe it. They, they, they find the invitation, they look at the invitation, they check when, where, how, who, and they say, ah, this is real, I want to go. That's where it begins. They confess Jesus is Lord. They make a point to repent. You know, it's kind of like a, a save the date. You cancel everything else in that time period. That's repentance. It's putting away everything that might be in the way. And you're baptized in Christ. You're putting on that garment. But the other thing we've talked a lot about this morning that's important for all of us who have been baptized into Christ is you've got to keep that garment on. You've got to be faithful to God. He paid so much for the garment you wear. Keep it. It'll save your soul. Every time we're together, we offer an opportunity. If somebody wants to be a part of this and they're not a part of it, we'd love to talk to you about it. Show you what the Bible says about it. Maybe on the other hand, you're somebody who has already partaken uh, of it and, you know, you're struggling with that garment. We all do. Everybody struggles with that garment. Just ask anybody who's, uh, any of our service people here that uh, have been in the service and have worn uniforms and, and, you know, what it's like to kind of figure out exactly the little ins and outs and tricks of maintaining your uniform in a good way, keeping your shoes shined a certain way. Um, so it is with Christ. We, we encourage each other. We lift each other up and we pray for each other. And every time we're together, we offer that opportunity. Do you need prayers? Do you need encouragement? We want to give it to you. Anything I've said, you can talk with me after service, and if anything I've said you want to talk about some more, but maybe you say, no, I, I need to do something right now, and if that's the case, why don't you come up here and visit with me while we stand and we sing about a great wedding feast. Thank you for joining the Church of Christ in Cornelius, Oregon. We can be found on our website. You can scan the QR code on your screen or the CD you were given or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cornelius Church of Christ. Thank you and God bless.